This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Thanks for downloading this episode of In Our Time. There's a reading list to go with it on our website and you can get news about our programmes if you follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoyed the programmes. Hello, we're back with a new series. In 431 BC, Pericles gave a funeral oration to his fellow Athenians, which has been celebrated as one of the finest speeches ever delivered. Within two years, he himself was dead from the plague. He had dominated the politics of Athens for 30 years, the so-called Age of Pericles, when the city's cultural life flowered magnificently. Its democracy strengthened, its empire grew, and the Acropolis was adorned with the Parthenon. Thucydides, the historian, knew him and was in awe of him. Yet few shared that view until the 19th century, when they found much in Pericles to praise, an example for the Victorian age, and his status has been revered and scrutinised ever since. Joining me from their homes to discuss Pericles are Paul Cartledge, A.G. Levantis Senior Research Fellow at Clare College, University of Cambridge, Peter Little, Senior Lecturer in Ancient History at the University of Manchester, and Edith Hall, Professor of Classics at King's College, London. Edith Hall, Pericles was born around 495 BC. What was happening in Athens then? Pericles was born into probably the most exciting period um, of Athenian history that had ever happened. He was born um, about 12 years after the Cleisthenic Revolution, which was when the Athenians had actually finally got rid of the tyrants and set up something like uh, the democracy for the first time. He was there um, at a time which became increasingly exciting because when he was only about four or five years old, uh, Darius, the great king of Persia, um, invaded Greece and his father, um, Pericles' dad, Xanthippus, almost certainly fought him at Marathon. And when he was in his teens, uh, the second Persian invasion happened when the incredibly terrifying march of Xerxes' enormous army down through Greece and the invasion of Attica and the Persian forces actually taking the Acropolis and completely destroying all the ancient temples and the evacuation of Athens and the nail-biting but ultimately triumphant sea battle of Salamis just off the um, Athenian harbour area. So it must have been a bit like people who grew up, um, who were born in the 20s and 30s, whose, whose very early adulthood was spent during the Second World War. It would have for, informed his psyche and I think his political position indelibly. At that time, Edith, in what way was Athens a democracy? Well, Athens had, um, in, in 507, with the Cleisthenic Revolution, uh, a couple of years after the expulsion of the tyrant family, the last tyrants of Athens, the sons of Pisistratus, had set up a completely new and very radical constitution which very heftily transferred the executive power and the decision-making powers to the free poor of Athens. It meant that they actually got to take the decisions in their assembly, the ecclesia, for on all issues of moment, and they started to be much more involved in the magistracies and the um, law courts, and there was a very, very buzzing atmosphere and, and a sense of, of the slogan was freedom, freedom um, to speak equally with each other, and this seemed to sort of somehow go with the fight against the tyrannical forces of Persia. Freedom was expressed both on the international stage and locally in Athenian democratic politics. Was this, let's call it democracy, was this unique in the known world at that time? It wasn't completely unique. There were other areas of the Greek world, Megara and um, Sicily, that were um, experimenting with different kinds of mixed constitution. But the point about Athens was that she had been quite a backwater until the middle of the 6th century. And she was very conscious, everybody was very conscious that she was about to emerge as a major player on the international stage. And I think Pericles, as a teenager, very much felt this. And he'd got, along with being in the right place at the right time for all these experiences, he'd got incredible role models in his father, Xanthippus, in his rival, who was 15 years older than him, Cimon, and, of course, in his maternal uncle, Cleisthenes. So he'd got a lot to live up to and a lot to imitate. Thank you. Paul Cartledge, uh, in what way did Pericles' family background set him up for politics? 
Pericles was a blue-chip, cut-glass aristocrat. He was one of the Eupatridae, which means descendants of well-born fathers. Edith's mentioned that uh, Pericles was a direct descendant of the supposed founder of the Athenian democracy. He was actually the great-nephew of Cleisthenes, so he was born into a political family round about 495, as we say. He would have inherited, interestingly, a feud, because, of course, aristocrats Democratic families, they didn't all get on brilliantly, and especially at a time of such change as Edith has described, when Athens is becoming a very, very interesting new kind of democratia, the kratos of the, the demos, the, the masses, the ordinary people. And the feud that Pericles inherited specifically was through his father, Xanthippos, who was an enemy of the famous Miltiades of Marathon. Well, Miltiades died shortly after, but his son, Cimon uh, inherited his mantle, and so Pericles inheriting the mantle of his father, Xanthippos, was sort of destined to be a bit of a political enemy of Cimon. And in fact, he began his political career in a way by trying to undermine Cimon. This is in the 460s. But we first hear of Pericles. He actually appears on the democratic scene in the theatre as a sponsor because he was very rich. Rich people were obliged to sponsor religious festivals, including theatre festivals. The beginning of his reputation began when he was 20. He, he mixed with a lot of thinkers and doers when he commissioned Aeschylus to do a play, The Persian War. That was a great success. Why was it so successful and why did it influence his future career so much? The Athenian system of staging plays was done by requiring extremely rich citizens to finance a whole slew of plays. So in Aeschylus's case, four, three tragedies, one satyr drama. Of those, the play that survives, it's our earliest Athenian surviving tragedy, is The Persians. And The Persians, the title of it tells you it's set in Persia, and it's about the result of the Battle of Salamis, which was, if you like, the battle that saved the early Athenian democracy, and not just the Athenians and their democracy, but in a way all Greece from becoming a subject area of Persia. Praising the Athenians in this and uh, giving them a great deal of credit for what had happened, the rowers and the people in it, and that was the beginning of the basis of his association with the people of Athens, which did him in good stead for the rest of his life, more or less. Completely right, except that we must remember, being aristocratic and being extremely rich, he is not a man of the people. What's now we know extraordinary, that. What is extraordinary about his career is how far he chose to identify his career with actually a system that did not privilege his socioeconomic class. Um, there, was a, there was a feud which is said to have held him back. It doesn't seem to have held him back much, does it? Well, he inherited through his father a feud with another family and the leading, actually, admiral of the Athenians in the 470s. This is the period leading up to that play of the Persians that I've mentioned. was a man called Cimon, and Pericles actually chose to take him on. He himself needed sponsors, he needed uh, supporters, and he was taking a big risk in taking per uh, Cimon on. But nevertheless, he did, brought him to court and Cimon never forgave him. And Cimon was ostracised for ten years, which left the coast clear for Pericles. Peter Little, how did he gain power, and what power did he gain? Well, um, over the, uh, three, the 450s BC, Pericles seemed to have advocated policies which favoured the interests of adult male citizens, such as payment for public service. But it wasn't until the early 440s that he became the most important player in political life. Between the years of 448 and 429 BC, the, election, the Athenians elected him 15 times to the College of Ten Generals who held that post for a year. And this was not only a military position, but it also gave him the right to attend meetings of the Athenian Council or Senate, which set the agenda of the Assembly or Ecclesia, which we've already mentioned. While he doesn't seem to have been a particularly inspired leader on the battlefield, he was, seems to have been good at making the best of the results that he had. 
and so he was chosen uh, on different on at least two occasions to give the funeral speech uh, in honor of Athenians who died in battle. But he um, did have he did have service in the field with with the forces of Athens. Yes, absolutely. Um, he had uh, uh, service in in different locations, different parts of Greece. Uh, um, I mean, I think Thucydides... Thucydides is his, his, his biographer and, and someone who knew him at the time, yes. Thucydides, yes, the historian of the Peloponnesian War. And one of the important yes. things that Thucydides said was that in what was nominally a democracy, power was in the hands of the first citizen, i.e. Pericles. And that's a correct analysis for those moments, and there seem to have been many of them, when the people appear to have found Pericles and his policies persuasive and supported them by vote in the assembly. So maintaining the support of the power of the, of the people at the assembly was key to securing power in Athenian democracy. But it's quite possible that, that Thucydides, um, also Pericles, who wrote a, uh, sorry, Plutarch, who wrote a biography of him, exaggerated his political profile. And that's perhaps why Pericles' reputation seems to have eclipsed that of his contemporaries, many of whom were attested not so much in the literary sources, but rather in stone inscriptions of the time. Pericles, as we know from what's been said on the programme so far, but came from a very rich background uh, and surrounded by powerful people. And then you say he was elected 15 times. And um, How did the individuality, how did that individual become so dominant in what we're calling a democracy? Well, a key aspect of that may have been his rhetorical style. Um, he's known to have had a lot of contact with the cultural critics of the day, Damon, the musical teacher, Zeno, Anaxagoras, people like that, natural scientists who were developing a science of oratory. So he may well have developed a mode of oratory that was elevated, persuasive, and at the same time quite appealing to the uh, male citizens in the assembly. Well, let's turn to the oratory now with you, Edith Hall. Uh, in Thucydides, remarkably, he, he, he gives three speeches to Pericles, but one of the high points uh, is this funeral oration, which has been picked over and imitated in the last 200 years numerous times. Can you set the scene for that oration, Edith, and tell us why you think it had such impact then? Yes. Every year during the Peloponnesian War, the Athenians uh, used to gather at their cemetery in the Keramikos, one of the loveliest suburbs of the city by the Eridanos River with beautiful plane trees and beautiful um, memorials to do a ritual funeral for everybody who died, all the men who died during the war. So it's a little bit like what we do on November yeah. the 11th at the Cenotaph. And one of the, th the main things here was that a speaker was chosen simply because he was highly respected and had a beautiful voice. It, you know, he, he was uh, chosen for the power of his oratory to give the speech to basically the bereaved. Um, so that's the scene. Attended. He's talking to the bereaved. What did he, what, can you give us the main points he made, first of all, and then we can talk about him. What were the main points he made? OK, it's, it's fascinating because he moves the convention from celebrating the past glories of Athens and re relating all the great victories of the past. He transfers the tense, as it were, to the, to the present and the future. So he gives a description, account of the institutions and the ideals of democratic Athens in order to paint a picture of what it's worth dying for. So it's a completely different idea of um, a speech. It's very, very little about the actual glory of the, of the men who died. It's all about the ideals that they died for. So um, the, the idea that everybody in Athens who's a free citizen can get a good chance to uh, uh, ascend the political ladder. Everybody in Athens gets a good education. Everybody in Athens has beautiful buildings to look at. Everybody in Athens has learnt to deliberate so they understand the true value of what they're fighting and dying for. So it's about idealising um, the city to make people feel that what they've got is so precious that it's, of course, worth, worth risking not only you know, their own lives for the, for the brothers and sons of those who died, but for the women of the city. And one of the reasons it's so important, this annual speech, it's the only time 
that a senior politician of Athens got to address the women of Athens. They could not attend the assembly. This was the one time of the year that they were given a chance to buy into the whole project. And he'd really got to persuade them. A lot of them were probably demented with grief and very, very angry indeed at losing their menfolk. So it was a really important ideological occasion for whole families under the Periclean democracy. And we know that it had a huge impact at the time, Edith, do we? I I believe that it did, yes. I I think that it managed to get people to to believe in continuing the war all the way through till the plague struck a couple of years later. Uh, We don't have any evidence, um, any particular um, comments from people immediately after it, but Thucydides had either pretty much memorised every word of it or managed to get hold of a transcript. Paul Cartledge, what do you make of the speech? It's one of those speeches where, because we've no idea what Pericles actually said, we have to go on what Thucydides said he said. Are we reading Thucydides or are we reading Pericles? Well, one of the things that um, I think must have... I think it must have been Periclean to this extent. He says that democratia, our system, is not one that we imitate from others. It's we've made it. We we are the uh, model. And he says it's a regime for the many, not the few. And there's a little bit of an irony there because Pericles was one of the few. He was one of the few rich, yeah. well-born elite. The other thing that's, um, if I may pick up what Edith just said about women, what he says to women is not to be inferior to your nature. In other words, um, don't caterwaul, don't wail and moan, but just man up, as it were, and uh, imagine that you've got to support Athens and support your menfolk. It's a little bit cruel, the last bit. Whether that was actually Pericles, one thing that anybody listening to it or reading about it would immediately think, what about your own womenfolk, Pericles? Is there any... uh Was Pericles then so outstanding or so powerful that he had to make the great funeral oration or did he do it as one of his steps to power and showing he had power? Well, as with everything in the democracy, Pericles was the servant of the system. He was not a, an uncrowned king, let alone a dictator. So he would yeah. have been actually been chosen by um, a procedure which we're not very familiar with. This, by the way, was not his first attempt. So he would have had a bit of experience of how his previous one went down. But nevertheless, um, it was a thoroughly democratic procedure, as Edith has very well said. Peter Little... Athens was particularly crowded at around that time. Why was that and why did it matter? Well, the ancient city-state of Athens consisted of a city centre with a rural hinterland with its own population. The city became extraordinarily crowded at the start of the Peloponnesian War in 431 BC owing to the Periclean strategy for surviving the early years and the, the Spartan invasions. The policy of the Spartans and their Peloponnesian allies from the start of this war was to invade Attica twice yearly and to ravage their territory in the hope that the Athenians would yield. Pericles' response to this was to order the Athenians to retreat within the city walls of Athens and to avoid face-to-face combat with the invading forces. He advised the people to bring within the city walls their wives, their children, their household goods... They sent their sheep and their cattle across to the island of Evia. There were two reasons why the Athenians were able to do this. One was the security offered by their city walls, which had been rebuilt over the course of the 5th century, both to encompass the city, but also to secure a connection with Athens' port, the Piraeus. These long walls were about four miles long and wide enough for two chariots to pass each other. And second, Athenian naval imperialism. Having bolstered her navy before the Persian Wars, the Athenians had the biggest force of fighting ships in the Greek world, and they used that force to dominate the eastern Mediterranean and to transform their League of Allies into an empire consisting of tribute-paying subjects. So physically, this meant that a large proportion of Athens' population squeezed into the few kilometres of the walled areas. Thucydides says that many crowded into poorly ventilated huts, and he himself recognises that this situation exacerbated the plague that struck Athens in the first year 
We have the plague, yeah. and this is a, one of the key decisions that Pericles made, bring mm. them all into Athens, which you so well described as a tremendous fortress. Um, it must have seemed right at the time, Edith Hall. Uh, was he just unlucky uh, that it turned out to be uh, to work against him, to be a bad decision? No, well, I think he was extremely unlucky. I mean, we know that pandemics and plagues cannot be predicted, and there was very you know, little reason for him to suppose it was coming. Um, Thucydides says it he came from Africa, perhaps Ethiopia. And uh, although the Athenians themselves spread rumours that the Spartans had, had deliberately polluted the water supplies, there's no real um, proof of that. That's exactly the sort of paranoid suspicion that, that you would get. But it was absolutely dreadful. Um, it was either What's typhus... absolutely dreadful? We talk, we talk, how, how many people are in the city and how many people died? Well, at, at, at least one in five died, Um some estimates are at between 10 and, and 30,000. Um, Thucydides himself got it and has left us the most chilling description of, of the symptoms. And, the, and he died? Uh, uh, no, Thucydides did not die. Oh, not Thucydides, Peric sorry, I'll mix you up. <laughs> Thucydides, uh, Pericles so, so died. Thucydides got it, sorry, I was, I was messing about that. Yes, so, and, yeah, so the symptoms. We, we yeah. know what the symptoms were, and there have been many, many, many attempts, including um, analysing the DNA of a, a fairly recently found uh, bunch of skeletons of people who almost certainly died in the plague has, has been discovered. But there's uh, typhus or typhoid fever or some sort of hemorrhagic viral fever, possibly smallpox are the kinds of things that nosologists, that means studies of the history of disease, have considered. But I do think he was really, really unlucky. I think it was actually a very smart policy. Ever since the Persian War and Themistocles, the Athenian navy was absolutely cracking and, and, and had almost complete supremacy. And because of the system of allied uh, tribute and, and, and the ships coming into Piraeus being able to be defended by the Athenian navy, the food supply was really quite secure. The problem was that they were incredibly sick. Was that considered at the time? Was that considered to be a blunder or was it considered, as you've said, look, it was just one of those things? Uh, no, Pericles' it's, it's popularity certainly uh, d declined drastically in the last year or so. Because he died two years ago. He died in 429. The war was supposed yeah. to continue for another 25 years. Yeah, well, the play came back in 427 as well. But it's actually surprising how little discussion in ancient sources there are of, of his culpability or not with that particular um, policy. Uh, I think that you know that kind of level of illness, I mean, it's like the Flavian plague that, that, that decimated the entire Roman um, army across many you know, countries um, um, hundreds of years later. There's very little that can be done. It's like the Black Death. Paul, Paul Cartledge, um, can we look at what had changed, briskly, what had changed under Pericles in Athens? Yeah, when he first became in a position to influence anything, he was the sidekick of a man called Ephialtes. And there was a quite significant reform of the way in which the Athenians did their politics, took their decisions, conducted their litigation round about 460 BC. In the following decade, because his partner had been assassinated, very interesting, Pericles took the lead and he introduced pay for jurors. And they didn't in the ancient Greek system distinguish between um, political trials, criminal trials, everything was fair game. So doing politics involved taking your opponents to court. And therefore, if it's the masses that are sitting in judgment, it's an increase in their power. One of the problematic, rather interesting measures that he is specifically associated with is the change in the rules for citizenship. Who was now, from 451 BC on, entitled to be a full Athenian citizen? From that moment on, you had to have an Athenian mum as well as an Athenian dad. You've always had to have had an Athenian father, but you now have to have an Athenian mother. Why? Well, it rules out any non-Athenian women. All Athenian women are now going to become absolutely crucial for reproducing the population. One explanation is the need to reduce the population, so fewer potential mothers, fewer potential offspring, but it is still slightly... A, a puzzle and a problem. Yes, P Peter Little. Um, what well, there was? We've, we've been talking about Pericles and this superb orator and a good enough general and a wonderful politician inside Athens and 
pro-democracy, uh, but there were scandals that surrounded him at the time. What Can you give us some idea of, of those and why they didn't rock him? I mean, I'm talking about Aspasia. If we could talk about her uh, after his divorce, uh, his separating from his wife, uh, he lived with Aspasia. Can we talk about that, please? Yes. Um, I mean, apart from, his, apart from Aspasia, I suppose he was accused of spending Athens' allies' uh, money on public buildings. Uh, but yes, uh, Aspasia and Pericles was accused of lechery. Um, he was uh, accused, or at least... Was that, his, was that proved? I don't think it was proved. At least he was, he was accused of it. Um, his uh, associate, Phidias, who was a sculptor, um, was accused of uh, leading women to him um, on the pretext, on the claim that they would be shown works of art. Um, and then after they had uh, spent some time with Pericles, they were paid off with uh, gifts of peacocks. Uh, Pericles was also accused, uh, probably by his rivals, of sleeping with his own son's wife, committing second-degree incest. Um, but yes, Aspasia, his second wife, for whom he divorced his first, was uh, one of the most controversial figures in ancient Athens. What and made that, her controversial? Well, there were things said that she, she ran brothels, um, and in fact that uh, Pericles began the Peloponnesian War, um, or it was joked that Pericles began the Peloponnesian War after the, Athen after the rivals of the Athenians, the Megarians, had, had kidnapped two of the women that she employed. Does this brothel accusation hold up? Did she? Was there any evidence? I, I don't think so. I think this was a joke. But I think what was controversial about Aspasia is that she wasn't an Athenian. She was from the city of Miletus on the west coast of Asia Minor. And Pericles uh, married her had a son with her, um, and that was something very controversial in 5th century Athens, especially given that Pericles had introduced some years earlier a law which excluded males who were born not of two citizen parents from, from citizen rights. Um, hard to say whether these scandals uh, affected his popularity. Probably not. He was his popularity was hit in the first years of the Peloponnesian War, but that was probably more to do with his uh, policy for uh, avoiding face to face combat than the the scandals that surrounded him. Edith, Edith Hall, his his life, Pericles' life, coincided more like, with the golden age for Athens between the Persian War, let's say, and the Peloponnesian War. How much was he responsible for that prosperity and that magnificence? Uh, he um, did two very important things. One was that he was uh, completely uh, single-minded about ensuring that tribute came in from the subject states to supply money and ruthlessly put down revolts when they happened, whether in Euboea or Aegina or Samos. I mean, any idea that he wasn't perfectly prepared to be ruthless in the pursuit of, of financing his democracy at Athens would be most uh, misleading. But he spent it on very interesting things. So um, apart from the fact that he, um, one of the things that made people suspicious of him was that he, he deliberately invited or encouraged intellectuals from all other parts of Greece, the brightest and best, whether it's, it's Protagoras and Anaxagoras amongst the philosophers and scientists, or it's Gorgias from Sicily, the great rhetoricians, all these people who, who were brought to the city and the great artists like Phidias, who um, he commissioned the uh, Periclean uh, building programme from. And he certainly altered the, vis the, the visual impact made by Athens immeasurably. I mean, at the whatever you think about the Parthenon. And in some ways, the Acropolis was, was uh, a great monument to, to Athenian superiority and the right of uh, Athens to govern um, the uh, rule. Um, he introduced, they started using a word, RK, um, and which means, you know, we actually dominate you rather than hegemony for, for the um, allies. They were now very much subject state. But when you look up at the Parthenon in Athens, and not just the Parthenon, but the Propylia, and uh, although the Eric Theon was built a bit later, um, this was his great dream, was to leave um, uh, visual monuments of the greatness of, of, of the city that, that he'd led. And this is completely undeniable 
to this day. He was actually brilliant, I think. What his great brilliance was, was theorising the democracy and its values. He actually put his very considerable intellect into um, why it was necessary, how it operated and what its benefits were. And he was able to uh, translate that not only into brilliant oratory and policy, but into the material environment and the festivals and the drama that um, uh, Paul has talked about. He seems to have been extremely close, for example, to Sophocles, the greatest, some people think, of all of the three Greek tragedians. They uh, seem to have been in, in quite a, a, a set together. So the intellectual glory that was certainly Athens had something to do with Pericles' openness to uh, bringing in the brilliant ideas from across the Greek world. Uh, thank you very much. Paul, Paul Cartledge, we've heard a lot about democracy. Uh, was Pericles a good democrat? I mean, at its best, as I understand it, uh, the democracy was, uh, the votes were given or the influence was given to 30,000 people out of a population of 300,000. Uh, so that's just one thing to throw into the fire. <laughs> was he a good democrat? Well, according to his enemies, and they would be of two kinds, rival politicians and people who hated democracy, he was far too good a Democrat. And this is quite striking because of his background. For people of his class, most of them, he was a class traitor. He went over to the bad side, to the masses. And I'll give just one illustration of um, how he, despite the impression one gets, that he was somehow above the fray. When he was very unpopular, as both Edith and uh, Peter have said, right at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, things were going badly. The plague hit Athens. What do you do? Well, this is great for his rivals. You prosecute him. And I suspect he was prosecuted for something like deceiving the people. In other words, you got the strategy all wrong. And now look what the gods have sent us, this plague. So he was actually prosecuted. He was found guilty and fined and sacked. Act. Well, you can't be more democratic than being in the fray, failing, and then rising again. Now, Thucydides, who was not a democrat, says typical of the masses. They re-elected him. But that, I think, is a huge tribute to Pericles, the good democrat. He was The idea of democracy was heavily challenged in the next century by, by Plato, thinking that democracy would lead to mob rule, too much populism... Anyway, democracy was not a good thing. And one way and another, it went out of vogue for about 2,000 years, and so did Pericles. Um, Peter, how did, when and how did his reputation re-emerge so positively? Well, it wasn't really until the middle of the 19th century that Pericles' reputation began to recover, although maybe it's worth saying that uh, in the in the 17th century, Thomas Hobbes, um, who translated Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War, had approving things to say about Pericles. Uh, he thought Pericles was a, a sort of serene leader um, who guided the people, who shepherded the people um, at a time when... Um, there was a danger of mob rule. And of course, this fits in very well with uh, Hobbes' rather negative view of, of human nature. Um, but it wasn't until, as I said, the, until the middle of the 19th century that uh, Pericles' reputation began to recover at the same time as, well, democracy, the political term democracy, uh, began to become more fashionable um, and stop being a dirty word. Um, so in his mid-19th century history of Greece, uh, George Grote, who was a, a philosophical radical, um, praised Pericles, uh, his style of leadership, um, and his, uh, his democratic-mindedness. Um, and that was probably the turning point and, and opened the way for other admirers of Pericles and other admirers of uh, liberal democracy in Athens, such as, as John Stuart Mill, to, to really take a new view of um, Athenian democracy. Could I just disagree? I have a, a rather different view. Pericles' um, real rehabilitation, in, in my view, w was a matter of um, the mid-18th century when the future Frederick II of Prussia, no Democrat, adopted him as an exemplar of somebody who um, 
uh, encourage the arts and intellectual activities and uh, refined recreations. And he actually wrote a treatise called The Anti Machiavelli, which uh, he elaborated this and, and Voltaire took this up. But politically, um, it is traditional to say George Grote, and it's kind of conventional to say the mid 19th century. You actually find Tom Paine praising him as early as 1776 in um, a dialogue um, with the ghost of General Montgomery. And in the 1790s, the British Radical Democrats, the London Corresponding Society, admittedly still a minority, but they were absolutely giving lectures on the uh, Athenian democracy, mainly Samizdat lectures that would be put down by the harsh censorship laws at the time. But he was a sort of, he was he was a secret I- ideal all the way through the Peterloo riots and, and adopted by the early Chartists long before Grote ever published that history. That's, uh, that's registered and you've said it very well, but it's still quite curious that for 1,800 years, which you're talking about the last 200 years or so, 1,800 years, he was virtually ignored. Do you have a view on that, Paul Cartledge? Well, simply that democracy was um, a dirty word. After all, the Romans hated any sort of democracy, especially the Greek direct style. Their successors, the Byzantines, lived under a theocracy, an autocracy. And then, well, the so-called Middle Ages uh, in Europe, there is not a trace of popular government except you know, sporadically in, um, for example, the city-states of Italy. But um, it's not surprising, therefore, that ancient Greece is at a discount. It's not so much um, Athens, democracy and, and Pericles. They hadn't got Thucydides and Plutarch. I mean, they, these were not available until the 15th century. We just didn't have these Greek authors. So it was impossible for everybody even to find out who Pericles was, except for the um, occasional damning words in Roman sources, which are basically inheritances of Plato. But they wouldn't have known what to make if they had had Thucydides. No. It would, you know what I mean. Um, when he was printed for the first time, Aldus Manutius, around about 1500, then people can then start to take the view that, e.g., the American founding fathers, my God, he's a terrible A-class traitor, and B, he fosters mob rule, because what is ancient Athenian democracy but mob rule? We don't want that. We want republicanism. Ah, there's a Roman word. So it does take, Peter's right, that it's not till the 19th century when democracy, the word, plus representative democracy, Edith Wright there, Tom Paine, come into fashion. It's not ancient Greek democracy. Pericles comes back on the back of a refashioning of democracy. So it's, a, if you like, a coincidence. Peter Little, what, fine, we're getting to the end now. What, what, what would you say is the legacy of Pericles for the modern age? Well, there are different legacies. Um, Pericles um, appears in different moulds in, in Thucydides. Um, compare that to the, uh, to the violent leader uh, embroiled in scandals that we have in, in uh, Plutarch's life of Pericles. Um, it, that was 500 years later, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 500 so, years so, after so, his death. Although, though uh, Plutarch's what Plutarch has to say is is often based upon the the comic parody of Pericles, I think it's interesting that uh, the Pericles of Thucydides, the serene and sensible leader, often makes him a tra- an attractive source of admiration for uh, people whose political profile or stance makes him a a convenient um, ideal or model. So it's often said that the current occupant of 10 Downing Street has uh, Pericles as a a hero. But it's probably quite easy for uh, somebody with uh, an elite education um, who shares some of the the uh, politically liberal values of Pericles to hold up Pericles as a, as a hero. Pericles appears in popular media. In the video game Assassin's Creed Odyssey, there's a very uh, fictionalised version of uh, a Pericles um, who is poisoned by Aspasia. But it's probably the case that, well... The reputation of Pericles depends upon the accessibility of uh, at, at higher education, in secondary education, of the history and literature of 5th century Athens. Um, 
if uh, it's only the elite um, who get to learn about Pericles, then it's only the, the elite who will use his legacy. But if uh, the, the history of 5th century Athens is thrown open to, to a broader audience, then, then who knows what legacies of Pericles could crop up. Paul, uh, uh, how would you evaluate Pericles then? And what difference do you think he made to Athens and therefore, as time went by, nearly 2,000 years to the rest of the world or to much well, of the rest of the yeah. world? Yeah. I mean, let me take that under two aspects. One, demagoguery. In our vocabulary, thoroughly a bad thing. That goes back to the ancients. Why? Because people who had a, a policy to put forward in a democracy such as Athens had to lead the demos, so they were demagogues. The other aspect is this. Um, should we speak of Periclean Athens or even more Periclean Greece, as is sometimes done? Well, I've thought and written a bit about this, and my own view is that the one sense in which Pericles made a terrific difference was the building program and that's what uh, Edith alluded to that that building program on the Acropolis and down below in the Agora Pericles had his fingers all over it he was very keen on uh, making sure that the money was not misappropriated he actually had a very strong sort of bean counter mentality as well as everything else so Periclean Athens for me is the Acropolis and the Agora building programs and finally Edith well for for me, I, it was his, I think he was intellectually incredibly brave. I think that um, he was standing on the cusp of very traditional, you know, archaic society and, and myths, and he was so brave about considering what could a society look like, what could an ideal Athens uh, be like in terms of all that um, intellectual input from an artistic input and i think very very few people sitting on you know the money bags of the uh, uh, Athenian of the tribute would have had that kind of response so many would have sequestered the money for themselves or been corrupt i don't think he was corrupt i think he had a vision and it was a very uh, revolutionary vision in an aesthetic and intellectual way and that sets an example for all time that we don't have to be stuck in the past we can try to imagine a better world well, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Edith Hall, Peter Little and Paul Cartilage. Next week, it's cave paintings. The prehistoric people who created these extraordinary images around the world, why they did it and what they have in common. Thank you for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. I'd managed to find three funny things that happened in Pericles' life and I didn't manage to get to try and leaven the atmosphere and I didn't manage to get any of them in, which was a shame, but there you go. <laughs> what about you, Paul? Like Edith, I had one thing that I was going to bring in, which is a cup recently found. It's a drinking cup in Kifisia, northern Athens, near the modern Olympic Stadium. And it has on it the name Pericles, scratched in. It has on it the name Ariphron, and that's presumably Pericles' older brother. And there are three other names, and people have thought this is a cup out of which they'd all drunk, and possibly drunk too much. How the hell did it find its way into a grave not a very rich grave in northern Athens but if I were to be a novelist I would say that was the cup they celebrated Pericles's victory as impresario for Aeschylus in 472 BC BCE Edith your three what would you what would you like to have said that you didn't say you've mentioned something about jokes Edith or light moments or whatever well, where are we yeah i had i had i had three possibilities one is the wonderful story that uh, the family dog pericles family dog when he's um, you know in his early teens his father had this faithful dog his father went over to salamis from athens to either witness or or join in the fighting and the dog followed him all the way there and managed to get onto a boat and get over there and i love this idea that this was the t teenage pericles dog and it's the idea of fidelity in that family then the other thing is the wonderful masks that the comic uh, com comic writers the precursors and and colleagues and rivals of aristophanes used uh, Pericles, one of his buildings we didn't talk about was the Odeon, which means the great song hall. He built this massive, enormous roofed theatre so they could actually enjoy entertainments even when it rained. And it was almost certainly designed on the shape of the tent of Xerxes, which had been put up to watch the Battle of Salamis, a sort of great oriental circular tent shape. The comic poets 
put that on the top of his helmet on his mask. So he had a comic face mask with a helmet, crowned with his own <laughs> Odeon. Isn't that brilliant? I think that's just, I think that's just it's really fantastic. It's called the head gatherer. <laughs> and the other tradition is that when um, a, a rival of his um, spoke, was, to, was talking to the king of Sparta, and in, in fact, Pericles had got ancestral uh, guest friendship ties with prominent people in Sparta, um, said who was, you know, there was discussion about who was, you know, the best ruler. And the Spartan king said, well, to be honest, it has to be Pericles because if he wins, he wins. And if he doesn't win, he still talks in his speeches to make people believe that he had. And that, I think, is a very telling story for, for spin doctors today. Paul, what about you? Well, apart from my cup, um, I like the nickname that um, one of the comic poets applied to him. In Homer, um, Zeus is the cloud gatherer, the Nepheli Geretad Zeus. So because Pericles had a funny shaped head like an onion, a comic poet called him the uh, head gatherer, the Kephali Gereta. And Zeus, Olympus, that's not a polite term. It means... <laughs> <laughs> You're a kind of tyrant. If you've ever watched Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound, Zeus orders another god, Prometheus, to be bound on a mountainside. Zeus is a tyrant, and he's got an enforcer called Kratos. Kratos means power, strength, might, force. So Pericles got it in the neck from the comic poets for being a little bit too lordly and powerful. Peter? We could have said more about Athenian imperialism and where the Athenians got their money from and, uh, and yeah, the you, violence of the now. times. The great cruelty imposed upon the Samians, um, the, the confiscation of lands uh, from uh, Athenian allies who'd revolted. Um, Periclean Athens is, is built upon a, a, a great deal of exploitation. Um, and um, I wonder why, I wonder whether that's one of the reasons that uh, his legacy appealed to, um, well, not just mid-19th century uh, British imperialists, but, but uh, others, other colonialists before them. That was, that was I the, think that, that, I think that I he had a lot in common, although not in terms of uh, aristocratic background, but with Lloyd George, who was um, absolutely mm. adamant um, in terms of, his, mm. his commitment to imperialism, especially mm. in India, but who then wanted to redistribute mm. the wealth garnered from the British mm. Raj to the uh, mm. British proletariat. I, I, I think there's a lot in common there. Did we miss out? Did you miss out? Did I miss out? Anything massive that, uh, that would have changed the whole run of the conversation? <laughs> Well, we didn't talk about slavery, and so we didn't talk about how the, the, the coined silver, which was an absolutely crucial, both medium of exchange but also bullion, that was key for buying in all the stuff that the Athenians needed that they couldn't produce. Well, it was slaves, and there were perhaps as many as 20, 30,000 at any one time. In the silver mines, they're actually lead um, with silver in it in southeast Attica. Well, that's in a way part Part of the economic basis of Athens' democracy, which we didn't really get uh, a chance to talk about. OK, well, you don't have far to go this time, do you? You don't have to rush for a train. Or <laughs> <laughs> you just have to sort of say few and put your headphones down and think. But I thought you got through it very, very well. Thank you all very, very much indeed. In Our Time with Melvin Bragg is produced by Simon Tillotson. Have you ever wondered what teachers talk about when no one else is listening? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Maureen Bake and my brand new podcast, The Secret Life of Teachers, goes behind the headlines to see what's really going on as teachers go back to school after the lockdown. I was a teacher for almost a decade, but I never witnessed a time like this. So I've created my own virtual secret staff room where each week some teacher friends and I will discuss everything from remote learning and mental health to offset inspections and teachers behaving badly. If you'd also like to overhear their uncensored star from confessions, then subscribe to my podcast, The Secret Life of Teachers on BBC Sounds.